Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, as Cham says, my background is in particle physics, in high energy physics. Uh, we work in similar areas, but in some senses at the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, I rib him too often about the fact that I do something useful. <laughs> what I want to talk to you about this evening is um, really the crossover between the pure research that we do in high energy physics and the application that that has to cancer treatment. Um, there is a joke, a small joke in the title when I say how the Large Hadron Collider cures cancer. I'm hoping that some of you will have guessed that the Large Hadron Collider does not actually cure cancer. However, uh, there is some seriousness to that statement. And as we go along, I'll introduce you to why. However, like any good physicist, I should start talking about things that I don't understand, which in this case means medicine. Um, one of the fascinating things for me when moving from pure high-energy physics research to starting to look into the, the medical side is understanding how cells divide and replicate and all of the different mechanisms that contribute to cell division. Now, I'm going to introduce a few terms as we go along. Uh, we're going to start off with the Greek. The most important process to start off with is called mitosis. What that means is cell division. I'm hoping that most of you will have seen images of cells dividing. So the nucleus inside a cell starts off by unfolding all of the DNA strands inside that nucleus, and then they separate out into two pairs. And then each one of those two halves picks up another half to form two independent nuclei. And then the two separate out, the nuclei separate out, form a new sheath, and then the cells divide. And that way you go from one cell to, to, to two cells. Uh, and you can see in this movie, the first part is the, the DNA separation. So right in the middle, all those bright strands that you can see, that's the DNA inside the cell. That's the nucleus dividing. Once the nucleus is divided, then you end up with the separation of those two parts, and you end up with two new cells. Now, the other Greek term that's appropriate to what we're going to talk about this evening is apoptosis. Something that I found fascinating when learning about the life cycle of cells in the body is that every single cell in the body has a pre-programmed lifespan. And it depends upon the function of that cell as to how long it lives. And you go from the very short, so white blood cells will live less than a day, all the way up to egg cells and neurons, which will hopefully last your entire life. The key thing about cells is that not only do they know how long they should live, but they know when they should die. They know when they should self-destruct. If a cell becomes uh, damaged, if it understands that it has too much damage to function properly, then this process called apoptosis kicks in. And that means that a cell, in a very ordered way, will package itself up and hand off parts of itself to surrounding cells. So the raw material still gets used, but the cell recognizes that it is no longer optimal for it to be alive in order for the organism to stay alive. The problem with cancer is that those two processes start to run out of control. Within a cell, you have two sets of genes that regulate how a cell divides and how often it divides. A cell does not spend most of its life cycle dividing. It spends most of its life cycle actually doing what it's supposed to do. The genes that regulate how often a cell divides are called oncogenes. 
or actually, more accurately, proto-oncogenes. So the proto-oncogenes in a cell are giving out the signal to divide and replicate. There's a balance in a healthy cell. On the other hand, you have tumor suppressor genes. And what a tumor suppressor gene is doing is essentially saying, calm down, just let's not do this all the time. When you have those two in balance, then a cell will spend something like one-tenth, one-twentieth of its life cycle dividing, and the rest going about its business. The problem is when those genes start to accumulate errors. So if you imagine that that proto-oncogene takes some damage and starts to put out the signal that says divide, 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 all the time, that becomes accelerated. The cell division then goes into overdrive. Then add in another error into the tumor suppressor gene, so it stops functioning properly. So now you have this accelerated instruction to grow and this suppressed instruction to just rest. Now if you have a healthy cell with those errors, apoptosis should kick in. The cell should say, Ah, OK, too many errors, so now I need to self-destruct. If the apoptosis mechanism uh, starts accumulating errors, now you have a cell that is going into uncontrollable replication and has no self-destruct mechanism, and the cell becomes immortal, and now starts to transmit these errors to surrounding cells, and that is cancer. So when you look at cancer growth and cancer evolution, what you see is this accelerated, uncontrollable growth. So cells are now dividing and dividing and dividing all the time. They're spending their entire life cycle just growing. And because they pull in a blood supply, they need resources, they start to suck resources out of the rest of the body. They grow their own blood supply. If you ever look at a tumor, it's got this spider's web of uh, blood vessels that run through it. And now, because it's connected to the blood supply, those uh, cancer cells can now spread out through the, the, the bloodstream. And that's when we have what are called metastases that spread, and that's when you get malignancies. So that's the start of the story. But what I want to spend more of the time talking about is how we treat it. Now, there are three main ways of treating cancer. Radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and surgery. The irony is, if you think about something, somebody who's being treated for cancer, the first thing you tend to think about is hair falling out, which is a result of the chemotherapy. And actually, chemotherapy is the least effective of those three methods. The most important is surgery. An oncologist once said to me, if you want to cure cancer, become a surgeon. If you can excise that tumor cleanly, that is much better than other methods. However, the next one down on the list is radiotherapy. And in about 40% of cases, it's radiotherapy that is the... Um, most important part of the, the, the treatment. The way that radiotherapy works is by irradiating those same DNA strands. What you're trying to do is to break the DNA strands within a cell in order to stop it dividing. If a cell is undergoing cell division and you start to get these DNA strands separating and you shatter those DNA strands at that point, then the cell will stop dividing. And you can actually stimulate that apoptosis process by making uh, damage, making breaks to those DNA strands. If you make enough of them, even with a cancerous cell, apoptosis still kicks in and the cell will fall apart and die. The way you do that is with x-rays. If you irradiate cells with x-rays, then every cell from one of those x-rays will collide with the atoms in that cell and knock out some of the electrons that form the bonds within that DNA strand and break that DNA strand. If you shoot x-ray beams in from multiple directions, then you can do more damage where those beams cross over. And that's really the principle behind radiotherapy. Now, I'm hoping that most people in the audience have not seen the inside of a radiotherapy treatment room. 
This is what one looks like. What you see in the middle there is called a gantry. Now, the patient lies on that black couch, and the X-ray beam then gets emitted from all directions around the patient. That gantry emits an X-ray beam that rotates all the way around the patient. So what you actually do is deliver beams from 360 degrees. So you control the size of that beam and the shape of that beam. And that X-ray beam then travels all the way through the body. But you add up to do most damage where you want it, where the tumor is. In order to make X-rays, you need a particle accelerator. Ignore most of the labels. It's OK. It's a heavy diagram. On the left-hand side of that picture is a source of electrons, so subatomic particles. You get electrons by taking a metal and you heat it. And when you heat it, those electrons start to vibrate. And it's easier with a voltage to be able to pull them off. What you then do is you accelerate those electrons with a voltage. So on the left-hand side, you've got electrons that have just boiled off a metal, and then you accelerate them all the way down that particle accelerator uh, until they're up to the energy that you want. And we measure that energy in electron volts. So if we've got a 6 megavolt um, potential difference, that's the voltage between the start and the end, then our electrons are going to gain 6 mega electron volts of energy. Now, you don't treat the patient with electrons. You treat them with x-rays. So what you do is you take that beam of electrons, and then you actually turn it back on itself. You make sure that by sending it around a curve, you filter out those that aren't at exactly the right energy that you want. And then after it's been around that bend, you slam it into a target. And when it hits that target, it stimulates x-ray emission. And it's those x-rays that then get directed at the patient and are used for the treatment. And then after you've generated the x-rays, you have all of these different collimators that are used to shape the size of the beam so that the beam is exactly the right size for the, for the tumor. Now, when you put those x-rays into the patient, this is what the dose deposition looks like. Now, what you see on the right are th is not a 360-degree sweep, but three fixed beams. So that's actually for prostate treatment. So you've got three beams, two of which are coming in either side of the pel pelvis, and one of which is coming in front to back. And you're trying to irradiate the area right in the, the, the center of the, the pelvis. In the, the top right, what you can see are the, the heads of the, the femur, so the, the, the hip bones. The area that you're trying to irradiate is in green, so that's the area of highest dose. Now, on the left, you've got uh, non-small cell lung cancer. There, it's a much more complex shape. So there, you actually have this continuous 360-degree sweep. And inside that green contour, that's the area you're trying to irradiate. And you can see that by bringing beams in from multiple directions, you're doing most of the damage inside that uh, area, even though the x-rays are passing straight through the body. But the downside is that x-rays pass straight through the body. Otherwise, we wouldn't have x-rays. Uh, straw poll, does anybody know what the problem is with this patient? Any guesses? I'll, uh, no, they've got no head. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not quite sure why they needed to take the x-ray in the first place, but um, I've also got no arms or legs. So um, still, good for diagnostic imaging. The problem with treatment is that x-rays pass all the way through the body, so they're not stopping where the tumor is. They're doing damage all the way through. Wouldn't it be great if we had another way of delivering radiation right where we want it? And this is where proton therapy comes in. What you can see here is dose deposition. So that means damage, how much damage you're doing as these beams of radiation pass through the body. Now, the photon line 
the x-rays, you can see you've got a peak that's a few centimeters in. So that's where you get most of the damage, and then you get this drop off as it passes through the body. So anything that's deeper than three centimeters is further away from where you do most of the damage. However, if you use protons, which come from subatomic nuclei, they're the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, protons are heavy and they're charged. And rather than passing straight through and then every so often making a collision with an electron, which is what X-rays do, this big fat proton will rattle. Only slightly, it will see all of the electrons as it's passing through all of the tissue in the body. And you get these little glancing collisions, bump, 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 as it's going through. But what's happening is each time it's glancing across one of these electrons, it's slowing down just a little bit, just a little bit of energy loss and a little bit. As it gets slower, it loses more energy, which means it gets slower, which means it loses more energy, which means it gets slower, which means it loses more energy. To the point where you get this massive deceleration, it comes to a screeching halt. And that means that it does most of its damage right at the end of its path. And that spike we call the Bragg Peak. And it's at that point that you're doing most of the damage inside the tumor. And we can control that distance very precisely, so long as we know what the energy loss is, in other words, what the density is of the tissue that it's passing through, we can control that distance very accurately. Now, if you don't believe me that Bragg Peak is a real thing, uh, this is a photo that I took of um, a liquid called a scintillator. Now, a, a scintillator glows when you shoot radiation into it. And you've got a beam of protons that's uh, actually coming from our only running proton therapy facility in the UK at Clatterbridge on the Wirral. And I'll talk more about that as we go along. The beam's coming from the right, and you can see that the light output gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, and then, bing, stops. Now that means not only that we know how to do physics, but also that we can use that principle for treatment, see how hard that stop is. You don't just want to use one energy when you're treating, you want to be able to send the beam in across the entire tumor. Now by changing the energy of that beam, you can scan it backwards and forwards. You can pick very precisely where you want that energy to be deposited. And this is a proton beam, again, that's being deposited into a big block of solid scintillator. And you can see, as we change the energy, it scans backwards and forwards. So we know precisely where we're going to deposit most of that radiation dose. Now, if you look at the effect of that on treatment, this is the same non-small cell lung cancer um, treatment plan that I showed you earlier. So on the left-hand side, you've got X-ray radiotherapy. On the right, you've got proton beam therapy. You're trying to deliver most of the dose to the same region, to the cancerous cells within the lung. So those slices that you see at the top, that's through the middle of the, the chest. Because you have this precise stop with the Bragg peak, that allows you to bring the area of highest dose deposition much more closely around the contour of the tumors, the, the, the tumor, what we call conformal. It conforms to the area that we want to treat. Another example is with um, a cancer called medulloblastoma. Now, medulloblastoma grows in the base of the skull. The problem with medulloblastoma is that it will metastasize out and around the cerebrospinal fluid. So what you have to do when you treat it is you resect the tumor. You have to take it out from the, the, the skull base. But once you've done so, you then have to irradiate the entire cerebrospinal volume. So all around the brain and in all the way down the spinal column. Now, if you look at the two pictures, what you see on the bottom is what you would do with what's called a stereotactic uh, X-ray treatment. So a single direction, not this 360 degree sweep. And you can see that if you're shooting from the back and having to irradiate the spinal column, all of those X-rays are coming come straight through the chest. If you're doing the same thing with protons, irradiating from one direction, then 
you get much less dose deposition to the rest of the body. Now, in that case, that's an image actually taken from um, a young child called Asher King, and you may have heard uh, the story of Asher King. The caveat to that is that, by and large, we don't do single-field stereotactic treatment with, with X-rays. So, actually, the dose that you see on that picture is not quite as high for x-rays with, with modern treatment. But it's the reason why, with our new proton therapies that I'll tell you about as we go along, we have medulloblastoma as one of the indications that we're going to be um, treating. So how do we deliver this dose deposition? It's not like x-rays where you take a big beam. What you actually do is take what's called a pencil beam. So the beam is much smaller than the size of the tumor. Now, because it's a proton beam, you can steer it. So you scan it backwards and forwards across the volume of the tumor. You scan one slice. Now, that means that the Bragg peak is only going a certain depth. But then you change the energy and scan a slightly shallower layer and change the energy, and scan again, and change the energy. And in that way, you scan across the entire volume of the tumor. This is an actual treatment plan. So you've got two images up there. Now, on the left-hand side is the individual pencil beam. We call it pencil beam scanning because you're scanning a pencil-sized beam of, of protons. In the bottom left of that x-ray, that's again, that's a slice through the, the, the middle of the chest. You have a lung tumor. So you're trying to scan across that entire volume. What you've got on the right is the cumulative dose distribution. So as you scan from the back to the front, you add up to deliver all of the dose that you want in the place that you want it to. You can see as we bring that beam in that none of that dose gets deposited just beyond the tumor. At least that's the ideal. On that picture, right in the center, that's the heart. You've got the heart and the spinal cord. So you're avoiding depositing dose into the heart and the spinal cord, in some cases, of a growing child. Which is why we try and use proton beam therapy more often in children, because you then spare growing organs. Now, I started off by saying that I was telling a joke by saying how the Large Hadron Collider cures cancer. But why? Why introduce the Large Hadron Collider in the first place? So, here's a clue. Insignificant though this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas looks, it marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions similar to those following the Big Bang can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Linux 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket by the time this packet of protons leaves Linux 2, it'll be travelling at one-third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage two of the rocket if you will. In order to maximise the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical, and the booster is circular, 157 metres in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets, they are repeatedly circulated, and the electric field is now pulsed in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion, and so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. 
Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy stage 3 of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 metres in circumference and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity as they are already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or GeV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometres in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 GeV. Soon, the packets of protons will be energised sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps, and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometres. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC, containing proton beams travelling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronise incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise, and the other protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns, where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is tracked in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes round the 27km ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. A steering magnet finally brings them to a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle tracks from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved what governs its behaviour today and where it's going in the future. Now what you can't do is use an accelerator of that size and power for the kind of cancer treatment that I'm introducing you. Uh, and to prove it, um, let me introduce you to Anastoly Bogorsky. Uh, Anatoly Bogorsky is a Russian physicist who was working in Protvino in the 1970s. Uh, and the synchrotron, the accelerator that he was working on, is something like a thousand times less powerful than the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, he was trying to repair it one day. Unfortunately, the safety systems weren't working and they switched the beam on. 
with his head in the way. Uh, the thing that I'm curious about is looking at the beam path, I'm pretty sure he was trying to find it by eye. Um, other than the grand mal epilepsy and the hearing loss in one ear, he survived, completed his PhD, and I believe is still alive. If you look him up on Wikipedia, it says, other than all of these health issues, he was fine. So, <laughs> other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? However, all of the technology that we now use for proton beam therapy has come from pure high energy physics research. So when we were designing and building these machines, we had no idea that this was what they were going to become. Although actually there's a caveat to that, because the first idea for proton beam therapy came from Robert Wilson in the US in 1946, which was pretty soon after the first invention of the particle accelerators. So some people had an idea that maybe you could use this technology for cancer treatment. But if you look at a modern proton beam therapy center, you see features that are very similar to the enormous research machines that we also build. This is one of the world's leading research centers where they also carry out groundbreaking treatment at Heidelberg in Germany. And Heidelberg, they don't only treat with protons, they also treat with carbon ions. If you look at the layout of this, it looks very similar to the accelerator chain that you have at CERN that feeds into the Large Hadron Collider. So right at the start, you've got an ion source. You've got that insignificant bottle of hydrogen gas or CO2 if you want to make carbon beams. You've got a linear accelerator, what the guy in the video described as LINAC2 at CERN, which is now LINAC4. You have an accelerator ring, you have a synchrotron. Rather than it being 27 kilometers in circumference like the Large Hadron Collider, these are only about 20 meters, so much smaller. So that accelerates those protons up to the energy that you need. Then you have beam transport lines, so magnets that allow you to focus and steer those protons or carbon ions and send them where you want them to go. Now, at this point, the technology starts to diverge a little bit. Because at a certain point, it's no longer just a particle accelerator for its own sake. You have to treat a patient. And at the end of these beam lines, now you have treatment rooms. And you start to see things that look much closer to the radiotherapy treatment room that I showed you pictures of earlier. So in this case, you have a single fixed beam line that's coming in through the wall, and then the patient on the same robotic couch, instead of that couch being mounted to the floor, it's actually on a robotic arm, so you can position the patient wherever you want them. That C section that you see, that's actually a CT scanner, so that allows you to take X-ray images all the way around the patient. The big difference between X-ray radiotherapy and particle accelerators is how you deliver the beam from all directions around the patient. The gantry in proton and carbon therapy is much bigger than it is in X-ray radiotherapy. And a problem like this does not exist in pure particle physics, where you have to mount your accelerator beam line to an enormous rotating structure that allows you to deliver the beam from any angle to the patient. And with millimeter precision, so you get the beam exactly where you want it. At the end of this gantry, you have the treatment room, what's called the nozzle. That's where the beam comes out. Now, if you're me and you walk into a treatment room, the disappointment is palpable that all of the kit, all of the accelerator technology is hidden. Most patients don't seem to share that opinion. <laughs> so when you walk into a treatment room, what you actually see is the nozzle and then nice, calming, white plastic paneling that hides you from all of the technology behind the wall. Some of that technology is pretty big. Not Large Hadron Collider big, but big in a different way. This is the gantry at Heidelberg. So the gantry needs to hold part of the accelerator that brings the beam in and then takes it up to the ceiling and then back down again to the patient. The beam line on that gantry is kind of shaped like a question mark, so it rotates all the way around the patient. 
because of the size of the magnets that you have as part of that accelerating structure, these devices are big. The smallest gantries are about 100, 150 tons. The Heidelberg gantry, which is the biggest in the world, is 600 tons, uh, 22 meters long, 13 meters in diameter, so about the same length as an articulated lorry. And what's the height of this lecture theater? What would you say, seven meters, maybe eight? So twice the height of this lecture theater. And that entire structure has to rotate around the patient with millimeter precision. So this is where things start to get hard. Particle physics is easy. It's the wetware at the end that makes things difficult. It's the people. On that gantry, you're not actually accelerating the beam. All you're doing is steering it. But you have to guide those protons so that they arrive at the patient at the right place at the right time. Now, to give you another sense of scale about how big these are, this is a view of the gantry with one of the operators standing underneath it. Uh, because he's German, he's bigger than average, he's probably taller than I am. But you get a sense of how big this machinery is. That also gives you some idea of why proton therapy is not routine. It's very large technology. And it's useful in specific cases where you really get the benefit of this very tight dose distribution. But when you do, and you can deliver the beam to the patient, you see real advantages. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have a proton therapy center in the UK. It's actually the first one in the world based in a hospital at, at, at Clatterbridge. But we are building two new ones within the NHS. One is at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. The other one is at UCLH in London. If anybody goes to visit UCLH, you will see an enormous great building site. And that building site is the new proton beam therapy center, what we call phase four. There are other things that are going in that building, and I'll show pictures of, of it in the middle. The Christie is almost ready. They are probably going to be treating their first patients this year. So fingers crossed by the end of this year, we will be treating patients with the first high energy centers on the NHS in the UK. The difference with Clatterbridge is that the beam energy from Clatterbridge is low energy. It's only 60 mega electron volts, which means the proton beam travels about three centimeters, which is deep enough to go to the back of the eye. So they treat eye tumors. And because they've been going about 30 years, they are a world-renowned center of expertise for that treatment. But that's all they can do. What we're doing at the Christie and at UCLH is delivering high energy tre treatment, so anywhere in the body. This is what the UCLH site looks like. If you want to find University College London Hospital from a great distance, there are two easy ways, one of which is look for the BT Tower which is a couple of blocks away. The other way is if you can find the large green and white glass building that's the um, tower, uh, the main building at UCLH, that's the way you find it. Now, there is a lot of cancer care that goes on at UCLH, but the part that I'm interested in is the proton beam therapy. If you look at the site, it's pretty much slap bang in the center of London. That X-shaped building that you can see just past that red region, that's the cruciform building. So that's the original University College Hospital building. That is mid-1800s that was established. They only stopped treating patients there about 10, 15 years ago when they built the new building. But right next door, we have the new proton beam therapy center site. Right next door to that is Tottenham Court Road. So you do at least have good rail access with Euston and King's Cross and Warren Street right next door. But let's just say it's not the best place to build a very large complex building. The site is somewhat compact. If you take a slice through the building, what you see on the bottom right, that's a cutaway of the building. Now remember that I said how big the gantries were. That big space right at the bottom, that's for the gantries. The proton therapy part is actually all below ground. So from minus two to minus five, it's all the way down in the basement. What you get above that is 
um, conventional hospital. There's a new hematology oncology unit that's going in there. Uh, there are um, operating theatres, consulting rooms. But if you look at a slice through the building, you start to see how compressed, how we had to squeeze in all of these gantries into the building. All of this way down in the basement. If you look at the proton therapy level, this is what it looks like. So the accelerator that we have is actually smaller still than the Heidelberg one. It's called a cyclotron. It's more compact than the, the bigger synchrotron. That sits over there. Then you need to take the beam out of the cyclotron. And remember I said that as you curve the beam round corners, you actually select the energy that you want. Faster particles don't bend so much. Slower particles bend too much. So you can use that to choose the energy that you want. That beam of protons then gets distributed to uh, the gantries. And there are four of them at UCLH. So there are four treatment rooms. And inside each one of those treatment rooms is where we will deliver beams to the patient. This is what the particle accelerator looks like. Now that cyclotron is about two and a half meters across. So not much different from the size of this desk. So much more compact than the technology that I've been showing you. The big part is not the accelerator. And the hard part is not the accelerator. It's not difficult to get protons up to the right energy. It's difficult to get them where you want them to go. It's the gantry. It's delivering them to the patient. Now, speaking of gantries, the Christie actually has uh, a lovely Twitter feed because they put up photos of all of the development that they're doing. These are photos taken in June this year, I think. What you can see on the left is the beam's eye view. So that's the back of the gantry as the beam comes in and then goes up towards the, the ceiling, the installation. On the right, you've got the treatment room, but with all its clothes off. So that's the actual nozzle. You can see the bare nozzle where the beam's going to come through. Now you have to take all of that technology and actually put it underground in UCLH. This is what the layout of the site looks like. So to start off with, you've got the particle accelerator. This is the cyclotron. The beam gets extracted from the cyclotron and then travels down the beam transport line. And as it does so, you steer and you focus with all of those magnets. And once the beam is at the right energy, going in the right direction, then you can pull it off and steer it into each of the treatment rooms. And so you have these four gantries, all of which are set in concrete, all buried deep below the ground. But the building, unlike the picture I showed you of the Christie, does have clothes. This is all below the ground, so we actually have to build a building around it. All of this sits about four stories below ground. Above that, you have the rest of the building all of which is sitting right next door to Tottenham Court Road, about two minutes' walk from Warren Street Station. The UCLH site is pretty big. The hole that was excavated is enough to take the Royal Albert Hall. The pilings that you use, the concrete pillars to hold the building upright, go 90 metres down into the ground. That's the same height as Big Ben. They had to take all of the earth, 80,000 cubic meters of earth, had to be taken away and put somewhere. I think it all got dumped behind King's Cross. But to do that, you need enough workmen and enough trucks to do that. When they were digging the site, there was one truck every three minutes that was arriving, being filled, and leaving. So the logistics of that is not easy. Because of the complexity of that site, the building is going to open in 2020, so a few years after the Christie. But here's where we're at at the moment. So fortunately, we had Channel 4 News come and look at the site about a month ago. It is a vast NHS endeavour. What we're looking at is effectively part of a cradle in front of which a cancer patient will be treated. Weighing in at 25 tonnes, this section is being lowered deep beneath University College Hospital in London. It's one of two proton centres being built, the other at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. Together, they will treat 1,500 patients a year. 
Primarily it's actually tumours and hard to reach places in children, teenagers, young adults, but also in some adults. And so mainly brain tumours and tumours that are in and around the spine and pelvis. Though even these predominantly young cancer sufferers only represent 1% of all radiotherapy patients. It was this proton beam therapy that five-year-old Asher King's parents fought so hard to get, eventually in Prague in 2014. His story catapulted the treatment into public consciousness. The engineering feat in installing the technology is itself a modern wonder. Teams have been drawn from all over Europe and beyond. The equipment supplier Varian is coming from the US and the, um, basically their equipment is coming from uh, Germany. The contractor is coming from Turkey with uh, uh, UK subcontractors. We've got uh, the facade coming from Poland. And the architects are Irish? Absolutely, yes. So it's, uh, it's a very good mix. By now, it is human hands that are manoeuvring this benevolent beast into position. When will you have had the whole lot in? We're due to finish all of the installation of the heavy work um, around the middle of November because we need to close up the, um, the treatment rooms so that we can um, build the rest of the building above. So in a sense you have to put the nerve centre in first and then build the building? Absolutely, the heavy engineering, the stuff we can't get through doors has to go in first and the only way to do that is using a crane. And when it's completed, this is what the proton centre will look like. Four treatment pods, the protons generated by a cyclotron that moves at two-thirds the speed of light. The proton beam is carried along huge magnets to the patient. Instead of conventional radiotherapy, this beam uses small parts of atoms, the protons, which leave surrounding organs and tissues undamaged. The NHS's first patients will be treated at the Manchester's Christie Hospital this autumn, and this complex in central London will come on stream in 2020. So that's the facility. But let's bring things back to the start. Why build it? What's the purpose of treating with proton beam therapy? Let me introduce you to Snowdrop. So in that picture, I think Snowy is four years old. Uh, that's her little sister, Posy, who's doing her best morning look. Now, Snowy had a tumour around her eye and it grew quickly. The picture that you can see in the top right, that was just before she had surgery and that I think is about four weeks after the first symptoms were noticed, so that's pretty rapid. Fortunately what you see in the bottom right is post-surgery, so successful resection of a tumour. The particular cancer is called embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma grows in the connective tissue of the body. That's a, uh, an MRI scan through uh, Snowy's head and you can see very clearly the tumour that's growing around her eye. Now fortunately the surgery was successful. It's quite difficult to see in that post-surgical picture on the left which eye it was that had the surgery. And uh, Snowy and Posey seem to be reasonably happy about the, the outcome. If you look at the post-operative MRI, you can see visually there's no evidence of the cancer remaining. The difficulty is you have to mop up what you can't see. You have to deliver radiation therapy in order to make sure that there is no residual cancer around the site where you've taken the tumour out. That means, for children, the best option is proton beam therapy. And what Snowy had, because we don't have proton therapy in the UK to treat children as yet, she was sent to the US, to Jacksonville. Now, rather than me telling you about it, I think it's probably better to hear it from the horse's mouth. So let me invite down Michael, Neville, and Snowdrop. Somebody's a little 
or shy. Yes, it could be a bit late for Snowy and uh, Posey, but they're there. So tell us the story. Uh, so it's, it was almost a year ago to the day, a, a year and three weeks, that um, a typically chaotic family life was um, just torn to shreds, quite honestly, with the diagnosis of, of uh, RMS, rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, surgery went well, and um, chemotherapy began at Southampton. Um, a, few, a few months into chemotherapy, we were... Um, radiotherapy came up, and... Uh, I think we are we are the human we are the human side of this evening, um, and uh, it was important for us to understand the science. Uh, that's where Simon came in, and, and our relationship. We we wanted to understand the apoptosis, the the Bragg peak, and and such. And uh, Simon was incredibly supportive there. Um, the proton beam and our conclusions made the decision much easier for us. I think with with conventional radiotherapy, um, it would have been a very difficult decision given Snowy's age um, and the site of the tumour. But proton beam, as I say, made that decision much easier. It was targeted. The long-term outcomes were, were significantly improved by proton beam. And importantly, the, the lasting damage um, and the side effects associated with radiotherapy were, were minimal. So Proton Beam offered us great hope, and uh, Florida turned out to be a, a, a very a wonderful experience for us, really. The, uh, the care and the, the, um, the attention to detail at, at the University of Florida was, was incredible. Um, you can see some photos above me there of, of how the girls were looked after. Um, Still quite incredible, a blur the last year, as I'm sure you can you can imagine. But um, to to see Snowy go off to that um, shiny white plastic room, <laughs> which in my eyes is still very scary, but um, uh, to see her to go off there every day for for 20 consecutive days was quite something on her own with no no sedation, and to lie there while, whilst the uh, the beam was um, given was, was quite something, and she's, she's an absolute hero, as, as you can imagine. We, um, we concluded treatment uh, in late May. Uh, baseline scans at the end of that treatment were clear, and we, we, um, we're, we're, we're delighted to be able to stand here and, and say that the scans from the last month, uh, three, four months on, are also showing um, no, signs of, no signs of cancer. So uh, on we go. Uh, I have to ask you about the wedding dress. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, it, it's it's uh, it was money well spent. I think actually <laughs> we were, we were we, Snowy was a, a, a bridesmaid at a wedding uh, weeks before the diagnosis actually in in, in Kent, a wonderful wedding, and uh, it kind of stuck with her through treatment and, and went everywhere. So uh, she insisted that every day would be a would be a wedding and uh we kind of made we made treatment that way and every day was also waffles or was that the Post waffles Street? the the wall street journal and and we 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 were it was a it was another another earthquake when we were when we were told as a family that we were we would be going to to the u.s for treatment um uh radiotherapy had actually strangely been ruled out early on and and then it was reintroduced um with with uh, a kind of casual statement in the corridor that we need to we need to book your flights to Florida. So um, off we went to Jacksonville and we we lived the city. It was an incredible place to be. Um, we are here. Um, we've just had supper with a with a family uh, from London who we we went through the experience with in in America. Their 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 daughter Martha. It's her birthday today. Uh, was there receiving treatment. So Jacksonville was a very positive experience. They've clearly got it right how they look after the patients and uh, it's just incredible and exciting to see this modern wonder as it absolutely is on our doorstep here and um, that, you know, people like Snowy will, will be able to, will be able to um, undergo this treatment in a, in, a more convenient, in a more convenient way. So tell us about the triathlons. So we all cope in, with these things in different ways, as, as you can imagine. And, and uh, as, as, a, as someone who enjoys exercise, I, 
I had I had to find my way out, um, quite honestly, in those first few days. So uh, diagnosis and the plan was made. And on that first day of treatment, I just decided to to have a little run, a 10k. And then we, we live we, we're extremely fortunate to live on Chichester Harbour, so I went for a swim. Um, and uh, and then I thought I'd do a triathlon by getting on my bike. Um, and I, I, I made the distances quite deliberate. I made sure it was a, an Olympic distance triathlon. I thought that kind of, you know, a closure on the day would, would give me strength. Um, it was dark, obviously, the girls. It wasn't at a time when, when my family, when the girls were awake. It was, it was approaching midnight. But I, I completed a triathlon on the first day of treatment. And, um, and the next day, I, I kind of managed to squeeze in another one. And... <laughs> And on it went, um, always with treatment and, and, and the girls absolutely at the centre of what was going on. So it genuinely was at, you know, four o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. Um, it was jumping in the harbour at, 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 you know, dusk or whatever. But um, treatment lasted for 200 days and uh, those 200 days saw a triathlon every day. Um, which was almost broke me, <laughs> but it, it grew as an incredible campaign, and we've we've raised um, uh, over fifty thousand pounds now for for the charities who supported us through it, and um, and more than that, it became a it became a a campaign that brought the community together. Strength in numbers was 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 no more evident than our than our community, and there are people who haven't enjoyed the benefits of exercise and, and the great outdoors for some time. So they were out, there were people running all over the village, there were people doing their first ever 5K run. Um, and we, we built an army of supporters who, who helped us through it. And, um, and as I say, the campaign rocks on, um, hoping to support uh, young children um, in, this, in this fight. Michael, thank you for your time. <laughs> then let me close by thanking you all for coming um, and encouraging you to check out the website Try Every Day for Snowy. Um, Hopefully, as proton therapy develops uh, in the UK, you'll get more of an insight into the treatment that we do. I hope that most of you get the chance to see it from the outside and not from the inside. But it's a great example of how we can take something that seemed like we were just exploring for the sake of it in high energy physics and take it and do something with it. So on that, I will thank you. <laughs>